also inside of it is that the more often that she interacts with us, like all of our other collectors, the more frequently, consistently, and the more consistently she returns the same volumes of material or more, including her social circle who does the same, she earns credit worthiness because it's reliability. So we can now rely on her over the course of time. She consistently is returning a certain volume of material. We know what dollar value that is. So we know what her ability to repay loan is. So she has the ability to borrow money immediately. Wow. She has the ability to have life insurance or health insurance immediately. So not only does she get this bank account, but she actually has a tool to ascend poverty. And she has, you know, she's become self-actualized in the end. She now knows that her destiny is actually up to her and she has the power inside of it. So there's all of that power, all the beauty, all of the gift and the abundance that occurs in that. Most of us never learned how to train our brains, which is why most of us needlessly settle, struggle, and worse, suffer. My name is Chris Doris, and I want to make brain training mainstream. This is my series, Tough Talks, Conversations on Mental Toughness. I'm interviewing badasses from all walks of life on what mental toughness means to them and their unique approaches to strengthening their minds. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Tough Talks, Conversations on Mental Toughness. I'm your host, Chris Doris. And before we get to our guests today, our one uh, housekeeping item is if you are not getting every morning at 6 a.m., wherever you are in the world, my daily dose, mental toughness tips in 30 seconds or less, those little nuggets of gold to help you get your head right first thing in the day. If you're not also getting notified of my blog posts that go out every Tuesday, and if you're not getting notifications of these new Tough Talks podcast episodes, then let's fix that by going to ChristopherDoris.com backslash lists, L-I-S-T-S, ChristopherDoris.com dot com backslash list put your name email click and you get all the goodies okay i'm pretty pumped about today's guest his name is david katz he is the ceo or the founder i don't know if he calls himself ceo actually uh of this amazing company called plastic bank i'm going to read you his um his bio and then tell you a little bit about him so david's been named one of the world's most compassionate entrepreneurs by salt magazine that's pretty cool he's the recipient of the united nations lighthouse award for planetary health recipient of the paris climate conference sustainia community award recipient recipient of the ernst and young lifetime achievement award he's the past president of the vancouver chapter of the Entrepreneurs' Organization and named the Entrepreneur Organization's Global Citizen. David is the founder and yep, founder and CEO of Plastic Bank, an internationally recognized solution to ocean plastic. The Plastic Bank is a global network of micro-recycling markets that empower the poor to transcend poverty by cleaning the environment. <laughs> How good is this? So the Plastic Bank is an ecosystem that provides, I just read that, uh, global partners include IBM, Shell Energy, SC Johnson, Aldi, Henkel, and more. His humanitarian work has earned him international recognition. David's been featured in hundreds of uh, international news and investigative articles, including Forbes, Time Magazine, Fast Company, Business Week, and, and Nat Geo. He can be found at uh, TED.com and is featured in an award-winning documentary and starred in an international reality television show. David is a steward of the earth and a champion for the poor. And the dude is deep. I um, was introduced to him recently by another former Tough Talks uh, guest, Meredith Bell. Meredith, I know that you're watching because you never miss an episode. Thank you for this introduction, my dear friend, Meredith Bell. Uh, and I watched Meredith's interview with David for her own podcast. And... Um, the, the dude, this is a cat who has done his work. Okay. Like this, that's going to become real evident. He's really reflective. You know, you can tell when he he's asked the question, he takes some time, a lot of times he takes a lot of time <laughs> to get present with his response. And I love that. This is a mindful man. And uh, I, I, I'm going to ask him if he's cool with having this interview go in like two pieces. I don't know that this is going to be the way it unfolds, but this is the plan, right? And you know, the phrase about that, you know, want to make God laugh, make a plan. So the plan 
is I want to ask him about, I want him to describe the company. Okay. To you guys. Cause I think it's cool as hell. And I think it'd be cool. I'm, I'm following it. I'm going to become a member. And, um, and then, and then I want to ask him about like the deeper, you know, like the, how, like, how did you create this or how do we create anything? How do we create our dreams? Right. All right. So let's go get him. Where are you, man? And here he is, the man, David Katz. What's up, brother? Oh, man, so much is up. It's remarkable. It's remarkable. I continue to be in the witness of, of expansion, I think, is the best that I could, the best I could express. Yeah. Well, that works. So, yeah. Well, you know what? We're going to talk about that, I think. My thinking about this interview, after having done some research on you, sir, is that I yeah. think it would be fun and useful for our audience to break this up into two segments. We'll do a what and a how, right? So I would love for my audience to know like what you're up to, like what you have created, right? And what you're creating, what's going on, how, you know, what's, what is it that you've created, how it's like serving the world. So like, so everyone can know exactly what, um, Plastic Bank is and what it does. And if they're interested, if they're you know, moved by it, can participate in some way or contribute. And then the other section of the conversation, and this is really the mental toughness stuff, like the deeper stuff, which is the how. How did you create this amazing entity from an idea, right? Because my mission, David, like the way I choose to use my life, right, is to inspire people to not settle. I do not believe that any of us are designed to settle, right? So I really love it. this. This podcast exists as like a gift, right, to the audience, give them gifts, gifts that they can take and integrate into their lives so that they can go create their life on their terms, right? So they're not settling. They already are creating their life on their terms. Say that again. Change the terms. People are already creating their life on their terms. On their so terms. Change, change the term, right? So that the terms right. match what the desires are. Right. Yeah. So, so how's that sound to you? Sounds great. Cool. Oh. So, so who are we? Yes. Question. Yes, please. Why, why, why are we even having this conversation with David Katz? Well, firstly, I think it's important to communicate that I'm just some dude. I like, I just some dude out of Vancouver, like just absolutely human but what have i done i've chosen to create the world's largest chain of stores for the poor where everything in the store could be purchased using plastic garbage mm. like school tuition medical insurance wi-fi cooking fuel clean water everything the poor truly powerfully need and struggle to afford mm. using garbage that would otherwise flow into the ocean or the environment as a form of money. Mm. We're more like bank branches, really. It's plastic bank, deposit plastic by mass and withdraw the things you need the most. Mm. All that plastic we collect and we sell to great companies like SC Johnson. Go buy a bottle of Windex or some of their other products. That bottle of Windex, if you're buying that bottle of Windex, you're directly supporting and working with the world's poor to collect that material before it makes its way into the ocean and helping them end their poverty simultaneously. So whether you know it or not, just through buying something, you're helping change the world. Hmm. What we've done is created a platform for every single person in the world to participate in the change that they desperately know needs to happen, hmm. but yet they don't know how to do it themselves. Hmm. We give the beginning ease. What was that? We give the beginning of the change, we provide ease because it's so overwhelming for so many people to make great change in the world. They don't know how, they don't think that they can even start. There's a paradigm inside that itself that they can begin and it can be small, but it's a beginning. So we're a for-profit business that is the world's largest provider of marine based debris for manufacturing. We're a three times United Nations solution to, to poverty and, and, and plastic pollution. We've spent time with kings and princes and popes and stuff and had a beautiful, crazy journey and all of it. And yet I am just some dude, man. I am, I am nobody 
but someone who is persevering and doing my best to serve my fellow man and all life on the planet. Well, that's very humble of you because what you're doing is a pretty damn big deal. <laughs> Could you paint a little picture for us? Like, give us a story or something. Like, what's something that happens or is happening in the world right now for someone because of Plastic Bank? Uh, I'll paint a picture in how it works with, with Lise. She's one of our collectors in Haiti, one of, one of our first. I'm always proud of her. She's, she's persevered and become so much. Hmm. I, I chat about her in my TED Talk, too. She, she, she survived the earthquake in Haiti in 2010. Hundreds of thousands of people died within a, a few minutes. Devastating. She was left a widow, survived with two little girls. And as a result of her interaction with Plastic Bank, she, she really is flourishing today. She has more children. She's, you know, she has a sense of worth and being. So for her, as a full-time collector of ours, she takes her kids to school. And while the kids are in school, she goes out and she's got a bit of a route and she collects from businesses and door to door. And she collects a volume of material. And before she picks up her girls from school at the end of the day, she comes back to one of our locations and she has an interaction with staff who know her, recognize her. Her digital bank account is, is uh, initiated. We have a, it's a blockchain banking application inside of it. So the value of the material, once it's agreed upon, once we see the value, the volume by mass, as well as the quality of the material and types of material, that value is then transferred into her digital bank account. Now, the digital bank account plays all kinds of beautiful things because certainly she has a bank account, which you would have never imagined mm. being to have before. Most of the population in Haiti is unbanked, not even conceive conceivable. And, and, and I know, and I remember powerfully the first day I was like 10 or something, I got a bank account and I felt like I was actually a part of society. I felt mm. like, oh, I'm, I'm, I have autonomy. And so it gives a sense of autonomy and then safety as well. So she doesn't have to worry about carrying cash. You know, that's amazing right there. Can I just for a second interrupt this story? Because you know, I'm going to slow this down because I can't tell you the last time I appreciated the fact that I have a damn bank account. Oh, my goodness. We take so much for granted. Right. <laughs> right. right. So, her, her, so her being able to even have a bank account is life altering. Life altering. Yeah. Life altering. We, we, I'll get back to another story, but so, so it goes into our bank account. And also inside of it is that the more often that she interacts with us, like all of our other collectors, the more frequently, consistently, and the more consistently she returns the same volumes of material or more, including her social circle who does the same, she earns credit worthiness because it's reliability. So we can now rely on her over the course of time. She consistently is returning a certain volume of material. We know what dollar value that is. So we know what her ability to repay loan is. So she has the ability to borrow money immediately. Wow. She has the ability to have life insurance or health insurance immediately. So not only does she get this bank account, but she actually has a tool to ascend poverty. And she has, you know, she's become self-actualized in the end. She now knows that her destiny is actually up to her and she has the power inside of it. So there's all of that power, all the beauty, all of the gift and the abundance that occurs in that. And then of course, the material that's at the, at the center is interacting with all kinds of other collectors. So it's amalgamated there, it's a spoken hub model. They add value to it and then they take it to a processor that's our locally approved and licensed processor. They add more value in country by flaking it or baling it, and they get it ready as a raw yeah. material for export. Flaking it? What does flaking it mean? Flaking, it goes to like a big shredding machine that puts into this little, so it, 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 it's in a very efficient way uh, to put a massive material into a small volume. Okay. So they shred it and then they clean it. When it's ready as a, as, a, as a raw material, it's exported, hopefully used in countries. Haiti doesn't have a lot of manufacturing, so not easy to use it there. But we export it either to the US or to Europe, where it's then used and turned back into packaging. So it's really that circular economy model. And we like to export it to those areas where there's recycling infrastructure already, so it can be turned back into, into, into circularity, as opposed to just flowing into the ocean. Hmm. And now it goes into a bottle, it goes onto a shelf, and so if you're buying that bottle off the shelf, you honestly are working with Lise to collect that material. And you are ensuring that her girls are at school. You are creating the way for her to earn 
her unworthiness, you are giving her the ability to now contribute back to society. You know, we're a for-profit business for good reason, because you cannot donate the end of poverty. You cannot donate the end of poverty. Hmm. So hmm. people have an entrepreneurial opportunity to build and be creative. I mean, the world's poor are the most resourceful. If they're not resourceful, they die. So you're giving someone an entrepreneurial, giving one of the most resourceful people in the world to creativity and opportunity. Will you repeat that phrase about you cannot donate? You cannot donate the end of poverty. The end of poverty. Was it poverty that inspired this whole idea in the first place? Or was it the ocean? Was it both? It wasn't, it's the ocean. You know, I grew up on the west coast of Canada. I grew up on an island. I grew up in a city called Victoria. It's a beautiful little place on an island. My playground was the beach. I grew up across the street from the beach. I was surrounded by the ocean. And 35 years ago or more, I began, you know, witnessing Tampax applicators or whatever else it was that was washing up on the beach. And, and, and it's just been in my, you know, reticular cortex. I've been looking for it. It became apparent, so I've seen it. Now, I've never had a job. I've always been an entrepreneur. And as an entrepreneur, you know, I'm just looking, I'm a solutions guy, right? So I'm just, okay, well, how, how, how? And, and I've been inspired more so by images of the decomposing corpses of birds and animals around the world. And I knew that something needed to be done. And when previous business gave me the learning lessons to get to a point where where in my pursuit of a solution, I was able to find one. And I think there's emphasis there that I would want to place because I didn't invent anything. It was already there. I only saw it and began to communicate it. Let's explain that. It was, what was already there? This, the plastic bank, abundance, the infinite, the opportunity to serve all building value for everyone that then returns reward. Mm -hmm. It was already there. That's an interesting sentence. It was already there. Mm -hmm. I didn't invent anything. I didn't bend the laws of physics. If you created something that didn't exist. I, I revealed it and then began speaking it into creation. Ah, <laughs> that's right. Tell me if this, I got a gift recently. Tell me if you recognize this. Speaking being, yeah, I mean, it's just so important. So I, I, I have a, I have a very, I've had a very spiritual experience. Um, the entire plastic bank is created an immense depth of spirituality inside of me. Nothing that I would ever considered who I was before, but I've really been touched by it. Again, that's why I say I wouldn't have invented it, never invented anything. I only speak it, I see it, and I speak it. And I am a co-creator of the universe as we all are. There's a lot of, there's a lot to talk about in that. I could follow a track, but <laughs> I'll come back. I'm not sure. No, this is perfect because that's really where I was hoping to go. This is a perfect, we're segueing right into like speaking being or creating from nothing or, or maybe that's not the language you're using. I, I don't know if you use the word create or not. I do. It's a part of, it's certainly a part of, powerful part of my addiction. Create, creating, in fact. You know, creating, more of the verb creating. Mm -hmm. Creating, creating creating we are all creating the old testament begins with in god's creating of the universe and creating what's there for me is that it's the continuous the continuation of it we are always creating that is who we are is creating what do you what is something that you really wish more people would acknowledge about this What, what is this? What part of this? Uh, that we're all creating, that we create our existences, we create our realities, we create our lives. Because look, <laughs> I mean, why, like, why, let, let me back that up for a second. Why is there poverty? Why is there poverty? Why does poverty exist? There's, there's so many esoteric conversations inside of that as well. I mean, you know, that, that's, that, that's hours of discussion. <laughs> Okay. All right. Of the discussion. It's it's in a, and and for me it is in the realms of the unconscious. Those who are living in the finite. 
So when we communicate that, the creating and the infinite and what I wish would people would communicate or be in the knowing of mm. is in the infinite space. And the infinite space is created from the nothingness. It's from truly being in the place that everything is available. Because see, when it's nothing, when you operate from nothingness, everything is available. That is where the infinite is. But when you come from a knowing, from a place of being, that's finite. Of course, you can't create from what you know. That's what you know. It's finite. It's about returning to a place of the, of the absolute expanse where everything is available. It's about knowing nothing coming from the, from the, from the know nothing state. That's where the infinite arrives because that's where it exists. And inside of that, of course, it's the very now, it's to be present on the very moment and to be in the moment, not tied to the past, which is our sense of identity or the future, which is salvation to come to a place of nothingness in the now, and then to create from there and to dare to dream and be unlimited in it all. Because that's where it's true. And when you create from that space, it already exists in the world and then you get to reveal it. <laughs> Everything you want and anything you want already exists. Or when I suffer, what am I forgetting? What are you forgetting? Yeah. Well, then, or when I, mean, I struggle. Pardon me? Or was when I suffer, when I struggle, when I when you suffer, you're in time. When you struggle, when you when you when you have pain, when you have pain, you're attached to time. Which is a construct. Not that time doesn't exist, but yet in our mind, we're associated with memories of the past or the hope of the future. Again, the future is salvation. We think that the sal when we when we're threatened, we think that someone is going to impede our salvation. If the future, something might happen and the future won't occur because in my mind, the way that I deal with the pain of my life is thinking that something will occur in the future where I will then not have the pain that I have today. But what I have today is really as a result, a result of who we believe we are based on the past, which is our sense of identity. So we either live in identity or salvation. Those are the typical two states of man. What are you forgetting? You're forgetting that there's no time. That doesn't exist. Anything that ever has occurred, can ever occur, will ever occur, can only occur, happens now. Anything that might have the possibility of occurring in the future will only happen now as well. Mm. It only happens now. And it's just a, an immense power in coming to the knowing that we only have this very moment is beautiful. And I know that when I'm suffering, I'm living in time. Do you have fear in your life? Fear. Do, does, my, does my humanity appear? And do I have times where I have this ego attachment? Does the ego awaken and go, oh, look, you see things aren't as good as they are. This could happen, that could happen. Does the ego mind appear? Yeah, do I have fear? Am I experiencing fear? Yes. Do I have fear? That's a different conversation. Is it real? That's a totally different conversation as well, of course. I don't know, is anything good or bad? No, it's nothing. Everything is empty and meaningless. It's a conversation. It's empty and meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. It's just as it is. You know, that sounds, okay, so the first time I ever heard that, so I don't know if that's a Werner Earhart thing, but that, that's where I heard that. It's, it's Life is empty and meaningless, and it's that is empty and meaningless, is empty and meaningless. The first time I heard that, it sounded depressing. Mm, right, it does for many people. Yeah, remarkable. It's just so beautiful, though. It's so powerful. <laughs> Tell me the beauty. Because empty and meaningless, those words together, I think conventionally sound dark. I think the ego mind's an attachment to it, to be, to be affirmed that things are dark is what is occurring. So the ego mind shows up and says, look, see, like someone else is trying to tell you, see what that's telling you, that see, that's a time attachment as well. You're living salvation. My salvation was just threatened because someone's telling me that it's empty and meaningless, so, but my salvation is joyous. So don't tell me that. Mm. But inside of it and the depth of all of it is life does not come with meaning. This, the microphone I'm speaking into is black right now. Does that mean anything? No, it doesn't mean anything. It's empty and meaningless. 
I give it meaning. I can look at it and go, oh, look, it looks, it looks really sleek. It's beautiful. I love it. It looks like it's going to perform. Those are meanings I placed on it. It didn't come with any meaning. The sun's warm today. It's empty and meaningless as well. It didn't come with meaning. I place the meaning. I go, oh, the meaning I choose with that is the nourishment, the, 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 the love, the warmth of it. I choose that the sun is amazing. Hmm. Life is empty and meaningless. It doesn't come with any meaning. I place the meaning on it. My goodness. And if you have the power and the knowledge of that to look at everything that has angst or, or even joy in it and to be able to recognize that you chose that, there's an origin of freedom inside of that. You go, oh, hold on a second. I'm depressed by that. I'm saddened by that. Hold on a second. It didn't come with that. I chose that. What is occurring inside of me that I'm choosing to see that as bad? Well, how may I be able to change my paradigm and look at that as the gift? What knowledge is inside of it? What do I learn from that? How do I overcome that? What do I surrender from that? Where in the past am I still attached? It's the lesson to understand that you are not in the infinite space. You are finite. You were operating in a finite place, ultimately driven by the ego mind. The ego mind just being the voices in your head. That's the ego. Mm. Not who you are. You are the one who hears the thoughts in your head. You're not the thoughts in your head at all. So who are you? Lots of conversations. Mm. Lots of conversations. <laughs> really beautiful talk to me talk to me about meditation yeah meditation well meditation for me is really about finding the space in between the thoughts mm. to be the to, to find the quiet no no that's not true the, the the for meditation for me is to be in the powerful recognition of my thoughts to go oh i'm thinking and then coming back oh thoughts coming back to to nothingness thoughts coming back to nothingness it's about being in the practice of recognizing when I'm in thought. So I have mo more power to go, oh, those are thoughts. Come back to the nothingness. That's meditation. And I would argue, I would argue against anyone that thinks it's different. <laughs> I mean, some people want to manifest. That's different. That's not meditation. You know, some people want to like, oh, I listen to my thoughts and, and then I'll pay attention to the, the well, that's your ego mind. You're paying attention to your ego mind and giving your ego mind even more power. And in fact, I'd argue that it's your ego mind having you be in that place in that conversation to begin with because your joy, when you're in joy, the ego mind dies because the ego, mind's, ego mind is alive in your pain. And so if you come to nothingness and if you find joy, the ego dies. And so it's fighting it's for its survival. And so I would argue, and in fact, my experiences are the, on the precipice of me having the greatest amount of joy in my life is when the ego mind was most loud. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, could you repeat that? When something great is about to occur, mm -hmm. that's when my, the thoughts in my head are loudest and busiest. Mm. Ego mind knows. It knows, oh, there's joy lying on the other side of that. <laughs> Can't have that. I die in your joy. Can't have you be joyous. When you're, when you're quieting your mind, it, it, when you enter into the space between thoughts, is there an emotional experience there? No, it's a real struggle all the time. Depends on what's going on too. It was a real struggle for me um, last night. Uh, I take an additional meditation at night and, and it was loud. It was really loud. I was really struggling coming out of it, but I kept in the practice of it. Kept being in the practice of like, oh, hold on a second. I can recognize all the thoughts. And at least at the end of that time, I have the power and the knowledge to know that the thought, that at minimum, I have the practice of understanding that what I'm experiencing are thoughts. Just thoughts. And, so then, and for me as well, it's only momentary, just moments of, of, of quiet. Just mm -hmm. moments of quiet. It's not like I sit there for 10 minutes and there's nothingness. That's not, not, not at all. I'm human, the human experience. What, what, what do you think the longest period of time is ever in your experience with meditation where you've been thought less? I don't know, five seconds? Huh? Maybe? Mm -hmm. Well, I, well uh, no, uh, let's say 10. Okay. 10. All right, we'll go with 10. Because I count as well. And when I, when I meditate, I close my eyes. 
not only I'm watching my breath, but I also visualize numbers being attracted to me. I just see the, I see, I see them like coming out of the wall. I see them at one coming out of the wall, and then followed by the two. I am in a practice of just looking at number and thought, nothing, being in no thought. And, and sometimes I get to 10 without, without being disrupted. But I'm in a practice, I, you know, and I'm learning all the time. And I, I don't know, this is just the way I do it. It's what I was taught. It's what I've been practicing for years. It's, you know, I have an immense amount of freedom and joy in it all. Right? It's where it's where my joy originates in the end, because it was already it's always there. Any other, it's where the depth of my love originates. It's where the, my service originates. It's where everything comes from that stillness. Mm. But you know, it's really interesting in like human peak performance. When, you know, I used to work exclusively with athletes for a period of time on the mental game, right? And uh, it is always true that when someone's demolishing it, like crush in the zone, yeah. there's no thought. And, and you know what's interesting? You know, you ask athletes or musicians, anybody, performer, whatever, like, you know, you just crushed that. That was like a career performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was totally in the flow state. What were you thinking? Uh, I don't know. Um, was it hard? Oh, no, no. It was quite the opposite. It almost felt like it was effortless. What's that all about? Do you know, my experience is um, as an amateur athlete, I, in my 40s, decided to become a fighter. Oh. <laughs> Mixed martial arts and, and boxing. And I know that, you know, for me as well, it became a beautiful practice of consciousness because, if, you know, if I'm in the ring, even just sparring, if I'm thinking about anything, I'm getting clobbered. <laughs> That's you know, it. Because awesome. I mean, you think that it would be pretty normal to like, all right, try not to get your ass kicked. Yeah. Let's not get smashed here. All right. So when I get lost in thought and I wander, my eyes then wander into a place of my mind of thought, blah. It's when I'm, when I'm conscious in the practice of that, not just watching my breath as well, but being present so that I can be aware of any strike that's coming towards me, right? Being in the full peripheral of my opponent. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, it's a beautiful metaphor I can put together around it, for sure. Boxing and, you know, fighting and, and consciousness, for sure. Mm. Yeah. There and, was and, and beautiful and powerful. I was really, really just as I speak it out loud because it's it was such a practice as well because like there's certainly this this not just the exhilaration but then there's all the pain it's the breath it's the it's the it's it's everything that's occurring it's the thing it's the it's just the being there was just a beautiful but boxing is super I love, I love boxing I love it I was never violent ever it was never not a violent thing every opponent was there to have me become as remarkable as I could as I was there for them I was there for them to grow and become and be amazing and be, a, be the athlete. I wasn't there, to, no one was there ever was there to punish anyone. I think there's some showmanship in, in, in televised sports, but there's just athleticism, sportsmanship in it. Wow. Hmm. I don't remember what I was listening to or watching in preparation for this conversation with you, I don't know what it was, but I had this thought, which is, you know, when a flock of like starlings or birds are swarming around in the sky and it makes these crazy cool like yeah. lines and whatnot, none of them are ever, are ever flying into each other. What is that? Where is the, who makes the call? Like, hey, let's go this way. And everybody gets it the same. Like, how come? Where, where's the, what is that? Yeah, what's that synergy like within, within an animal that gives itself to the, to the collective that inherently already knows that it's a part of the collective? Mm. The humans that are the individual. And I think even in a flock of humans, that <laughs> we would, there'd be all, there'd be all kinds of people. Some people would want to follow along, but a lot of people would be like, yeah, hell no, I'm not following along. And why is everyone following along? And what? Someone told you to follow along. You're a sheep. I think animal life gives itself into the community. 
we're, we're the individuals, however, coming from community. It's crazy. You know, something I like to communicate has just occurred to me here in, in, this, in this place and that out of the billions of species that have ever existed on the earth, some 10 billion species, humans just being one of the species, 10 billion species of life on the planet, that humans are the only one that have ever evolved to be able to steward all others. Steward? Steward, to care for. Humans are the only species ever to have existed that can care for all of the other species. Oh. And yet we mess it up all the time. Do you think that we're evolving in a um, in the direction as a species of higher consciousness? I hope so. Do you think so? I believe the universe is experiencing itself through us, so I think so. Who are some of your teachers? My greatest teacher was was my middle child, Ella. She was born with Down syndrome unexpectedly, beautiful, beautiful Ella. She was such a remarkable, so self-expressed, mm. so honest, so in the very moment. If she ever <laughs> was waiting for something, I'd be like, oh, when are we gonna go and be together? When are we gonna go for ice cream? But that was her only paradigm of time. <laughs> she was never in the consideration that think that other people would think things about her. She was self-expressed. She didn't think that people could even think things about her. She's very present conscious. And so that was the origination of it. For me, when she was born, I was so, so ego attached. I was raised in such a conditional family, so much judgment that I felt that when she was born, that it was going to be proof that I would be judged by society. I had an inability to see her and to love her when she was born. But over the course of time, as patiently as it occurred, I began to see who she was, see who people are, to see beneath, to see inside the soul through the eyes. She was the real origination of, you know, the work that I'm endeavoring to accomplish today. And then we lost her three years ago as well. So I also have the lesson of her leaving, the gift of all of that, the depth of love, the greater sense of service. You know, in the acknowledgement that life is empty and meaningless, it became a powerful practice. I could go on and on about that, but I don't think that it had a better or greater or more loving teacher at the very appropriate moment of my life than her as all of our children bring to us. Yeah, and that's all beauty. I have no sorrow or, or, or lament for that experience. Beautiful. There's nothing that can occur that changes it. There's no pain, no sorrow that brings anyone back. All we have to do is to then look for the gift in it. When you pay the price in full in advance, what's left for you is to find the price. Did I hear you say that you do not have sorrow? I get sad some, sometimes like I watch a video or something like that, I'm like, oh. So, and I, and it's just this depth of love, like, you know, I love that expression that, that, um, that sorrow is, is often, you know, unplaced love. Oh. Right? So I have unplaced love, like, oh, I have so much love for Ella. And I always want to, like, you know, ingest her, right? I just want to, oh, and it's got nowhere to go. So, like, oh, well, it kind of bounces around inside for a little bit. And then I'm like, okay, now let it settle. Yeah. It's not possible to change it. It's not even a conversation to say, oh, if I would, I would change that in a second. And if you can't, why even be in the contemplation? You know, if you've paid the price in full in advance and there's no refund, 
what's available for you, the only thing available for you is how you show up and what you do with that. I'm not sure I'm totally gathering that. If you pay the, the fee in full in advance. I, I, I had a daughter that died. I paid the price in full, mm -hmm. in advance. There's no refund. She doesn't come back. I already paid the price. It's all that has occurred. Nothing I could ever do or hope for changes any of that. Mm. I've paid the price in full in advance. Okay, I paid the price in full in advance. The rest of my life unfolds. I just paid that. Where's the gift inside of that? How do I take that? Look at that and go, oh, look, this is how I'm going to be. This is the lessons I took. This is the depth I see. Oh, look, where else, what else beautiful is emerging from all of that? These are brilliant questions to be in the inquiry of... <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, you're dropping, like you. Uh, like, this whole interview, you've been you've been reciting inquiry, mm. Mm. right? Like, like mm. I, I want to re-listen to this, and I want to record seriously, like all these questions, man, because I think that there's so much value in being in these inquiries, examining, examining, exactly. yeah. look, look for it, look for it, look for it, look for it. What's inside of that? Where's that? Where, what's the gift? But it's not just inquiry. In, I think it's, it's inquiry, but see, in the recognition that life is beautiful and powerful as I choose it to be, because that's what's available. Life is full of love and it's infinite. And if it's a gift, and if, I'm, if the probability of us even being in existence is improbable, if our absolute existence is absolutely mathematically improbable, we should not exist. So if I look at it and go, oh my goodness, my life is a gift, then we have to also be in the acknowledgement that everything that occurs in our lives is as well a gift. It's a part of the gift. So where is the gift in it? So there's query to yeah. be in query over it, but it's in query to see the gift is to look for, again, it's what we manifest. We'll call it the secret. We will call it whatever we want, but we see what we're looking for. We see what we already believe. You know, there's the saying, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, it's not true. What you see is what you believe. And the expression, you know, change your thinking, change your life. That's exactly the, 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 the example. Change what it is that you want in your life. Begin to speak it, be it. Look for what it is, what you want in your life. And the infinite universe, everything you want is available in the infinite space. It's infinitely available. So just begin looking for it. Ask for it. Where is it? Where's the gift in that? Where's the gift in that? Where's the gift in that? Where's the gift in all of it? It's beautiful. It's always a gift. <laughs> it's nothing but a gift. But the ego mind shows up and tells us that it's not. <laughs> and we believe it. That's the, that's the sad part. Have you ever into Alan Watts? Oh, I love Alan Watts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> human. Alan Watts, the human, is remarkable. Love Alan Watts. Yeah, he just reminded me of him. Uh, one of my favorite quotes of his. I love listening to that guy. Yeah. yeah. Awesome voice. Awesome, all of it. It's a totally, it's totally yeah. character. Amazing laugh. Love, 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 yeah. You know, he must have smoked a lot. <laughs> right? <laughs> so right. Yeah. But uh, my, yeah. my, my favorite quote of his is that each of us is an aperture through which the universe observes itself. Only the game that we're playing is to not know that. Right. And he talks about the ultimate game of hide and seek. We hide ourselves to find ourselves. That's what you're reminding me of right now. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah. What are you speaking into creation these days? Uh, well, when I, I live into the creation that I've spoken, which is, you know, this place of, of a world without waste. Right. So I, you know, I've spoken in this existence that materials are used as a resource for humanity. You know, when we look at it, like really, like, are we gonna really spend in fifty years from now? Are we really gonna be taking all the materials that come into our house, houses, like packaging and other things, and put them on a curb? These resources and have someone take them and put them in a landfill? Of course not. But those are all going to be returned to manufacturing. All of it is circularity. Of course it is. All of those material resources brought back 
in the, in the circularity, the regeneration of the earth, the repair of the earth, is what I speak in the creation, or spoken in the creation. This place, this regeneration economy, where sustainability and the, the conversations of sustainability, which are passe and thin veils, thin veils of deceit, when I speak into the into the existence, the generation, the you know, look look what happened over with with the Greta, like with the with the whole climate action, we had tens of millions of students in the street protesting. Do you think that they're the ones? Do you th look at the proliferation of used clothing stores? Yeah, you know, my fifteen year old daughter, although she likes new clothes, she what she loves to do is go say she bought secondhand clothes. That's what's unfolding. That's the generation. And so I speak that into existence. Regeneration, the place where each, each human repairs the damage that's already existed, the place where we now are truly the stewards over all life, where we create the environment for all things to flourish. Of course, the consciousness has to occur. That or we die, because without the consciousness, of course, we'll only be serving self. It's a zero-sum game. Hmm. And so for life to flourish on the earth, we... We, we need to find a space in between ourself and this ego mind of ours. It's a way more beautiful place to be. Okay. Take me 10 years into the future, what's happening with Plastic Bank? In 10 years, we're you know, truly a global organization. We're operating in every country and everyone is associated with the monetization of the material as we do in country now where every household has the ability to have uh, an application that allows them to be able to return their material resources for for value it's not always cash you know like that's where having the immediate access to school tuition is important to hundreds of schools that accept plastic as payment for tuition so more little girls get to go to school that's an example of it. Like within Haiti, it's $20 a month to go to school in Haiti with hundreds of thousands of children who can't go to school because $20 is beyond the means of the family. Mm. Average, average income is somewhere around $80 a month. So when you've got two kids in school, will you really take half of your income to put them in school? Where would you eat from what you do? So children don't go to school, but now schools are collection locations. So the family looks at the household material and the plastic in their environment as money because it's not the $20 a month even. They don't look at it as $20 a month. They look at it as the end of poverty because if their children can't go to school, poverty will never leave their family. You see, that's the paradigm. That's the exponentiality behind it. Because for us, it's about how might we truly reveal the value outside of the money. It's not the money, it's what the money gets that people change their life for. So it's not that you're even exchanging if you're a minimum wage you know, in Canada, it's like almost $15 an hour. It's not $15 an hour that you exchange your life for. It's the things that the $15 gets you. So what might, what might it be that with what value, what perceived, what opportunity is it? That's where, that's where credit or financial inclusion is so powerful because that's a powerful incentive. It doesn't even have to be an increase in the value of the plastic itself, but what do you get with it? What do you now have access to? like within the Philippines, medical insurance or illness insurance. So the mother of the house can name herself as a beneficiary over a husband who, who may get sick or injured at work. And if that happens, the family's destitute. Well, for 80 cents a month, she can collect that material in like an hour and she can collect that material and she can name herself as a beneficiary. So she can collect plastic to pay the premium. Wow. So, so it's worth it for her. So it's like, oh, what? I, I just have to collect some plastic, which is all around me anyhow, and I'm safe and, and I'm safe. So what is it like for a mother who shows up with her children who has a sense of safety about her? It's a comprehensively different paradigm. What goes away first? What goes away first? Plastic waste or poverty? Plastic waste. It's like, I, I, I struggle with it because like in my, in, in my paradigm, like, it, you know, like what comes first, the chicken or the egg? So what's the, what comes first in, in the plastic bank? Well, live chickens. I'm giving birth to live chickens. So there is no chicken or egg. Live chicken giving birth to live chickens. 
because it all has it happens simultaneously. So hard to say which one because when we when we when we remove and we use those resources in the world as money for the poor, as money for the emerging. I've got to watch my words. The people who are who are, who are emerging and becoming resourceful in, in contribution to society. And again, it's not just plastic for us, it's all material resources, it's all aluminums and papers and everything else. Just out of plastic as a conversation, there's almost 10 trillion kilograms of plastic on the earth. So roughly a dollar a kilo more, really. So it's a $10 trillion value of plastic that we've manufactured and just discarded in the environment and in landfills. It's roughly 500 billion to end all poverty. We all we end all extreme poverty with 500 billion. We have ten trillion dollars of value just wow. sitting in plastic. Wow! Huh. So have we inadvertently been depositing the very value to end all suffering? You see, I don't think plastic's going to go away. Waste will go away. We will when we eliminate the word waste, because things are again creative through word. So when we look at it as a resource, as a tool as opportunity, then we begin to reveal the other services and products around it. Mm -hmm. That's a waste, waste management. What? Mm -hmm. When we communicate waste, we then give birth to waste management. Misplaced waste, waste in the environment. Right. How about resources? We have resources in the environment to go get. We have resource management. I mean, just in that expression as a whole, it's a profound paradigm shift. Yes, it is. Yeah, right. That's, <laughs> now you're reminding me of my boy Wayne Dyer. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Uh, I know I am, so I am conscious of the construct of time. Yeah. <laughs> now you got a gig. Before, before we bounce, though, I want to give one more gift uh, to the audience in this question. Like, I, you have to get requests from people. Like for advice, like because you started something profound out of an idea. Yeah, that is a success story. The end. Okay, can't debate it. Thank you. So when somebody says, "Hey, man, like I have a dream. I want to have my own business, but damn, I don't know. I don't. I don't know how I'm going. I don't know how." Yeah. How do you respond to that? I, the, the biggest gift I received in the whole thing came in the very first 10 seconds of the idea. So I had three thoughts. I love conveying this. I had three thoughts at that moment. And I had this communication with, with a mutual friend of ours, this the beautiful part of it that, so I had the idea of the plastic bank. I had all of the, all of the, all of the noise in my head of everything that could occur, money for the world, pop the poor don't throw it away. That could be a solution, all of those things. The, all the hair on the back of my neck stand up and visceral experience of like, oh, this is something, this is new and powerful and remarkable. And oh my goodness, like, oh, I, it's not possible for me to, to not try. I, it's beyond me now, I have to. But then I had all of the other thoughts, just like you expressed there, like you have an idea and then you get all of the ego mind. The ego mind doesn't want you to be happy. So the ego mind shows up and tells you every single reason that is imaginable with it's already in your realm of imagination of why you can't do it and why you're not the right person and, and, and why everything else. And that was a super loud thought as well, because it was louder than the origination of the idea. It showed up to say, no, that joy lies on the other side of you and the execution of that. You are not the person. But I had that the third thought, the third quiet thought, and and it really is. This is where the origination of all of my life's unfolding has occurred. Was in the very stillness of it, and and I, I you know I just I expressed it the other day. And it was really beautiful because it was super quiet. It was a super silent thought. It was like still, peaceful. David, you don't need to be that person. You don't you don't need to do that at all. You only slowly, slowly need to become that person. You get to choose to become the person who can make that change. Mm -hmm. Wow. You see, it's so much easier because it's, you don't have to commit to the end because you don't even know what the end is. Oh. You just have to commit to the journey of life. 
the unfolding of your soul. In that moment, did you make that choice? Is that when you made that choice? That's, when, that's exactly when it occurred. I said, okay, I'm good. I don't know how to do it. I don't need how to do it. I don't, I, why? Like, I, I can't, okay, got it. I could do a little bit more today. I could go figure some stuff out. I began communicating it. I began using my word, involving people, telling people, getting feedback from everyone, saying, this is my idea, this is what's going on. And it's iterated from that original expression. The original, the original idea, truth be told, was 3D printing. The original idea was like, oh, take plastic, create 3D printing. People could turn stuff into really expensive items they could sell. Mm. So how do I maximize the change of, of value in the plastic? How can I take a bottle and then turn it into a component that is in, inaccessible in that community that can sell for $20? Like, oh, that was, so there was a real maximum and it's still a part of it. We began creating extruders for plastic where you could take environmental plastic, turn it into 3D printing filament and make stuff. That was the origination. But so we're, here we are today. Mm -hmm. I just had to slow down that ambition because that really is the maximum expression of the value creation of the material, changing its shape for utility. But that's not readily available around the world. 3D printing. How do you get 3D? How do you get the most world's most illiterate to even conceive that you could turn manufacture things locally? Who would do it? All those things. But I just began. I began speaking it out loud and telling people and being in execution and trying a little bit, trying a little bit. And here we are today. I just gave myself to becoming the person. And so inside of that as well, it was with the end in mind. And with the end in mind is like I knew that this is what was going to occur. I didn't have a time commitment. I didn't say if this by when. I mean, but I was just like, this is what's occurred. This is what's unfolded in the world. So I didn't know it was going to occur. I was just in the action of it. Because you chose, I chose. to be the guy who gets this done. Correct. You chose to be that guy. When you were waiting Correct. to become that guy, right? Yeah. You weren't becoming great. You just chose, here I am. I'm that guy now. I'm the guy who gets this done. Yeah, and the guy who gets it done is the one who becomes that person. And in that, I became the person. Was that a one-time decision? That was a, that was a, that was a, it was a connection to the infinite because that decision is continuing to unfold. There was a moment that I had made the decision, but the decision continues to expand. Amen to that, brother. Yeah. All right, where do people go to follow you? Plasticbank.com, I can't leave anything without everyone knowing that every time they buy something, they vote for it. If you buy stuff with excessive packaging, if you buy things that are single use material, if you buy things that degrade the environment, if you, if you buy those things, what, the, what companies do is they sell what people buy. So if you keep buying it, you're voting for it. So you can't even be in the consideration of the environment, the ocean, anything else, and continue to buy things that degrade it. Please stop the hypocrisy. You said uh, Windex. Who else? Give us some companies. Uh, Windex, Henkel, Hugo Boss, uh, in, in some regions, Coca-Cola. We've got one of the world's largest car manufacturers coming out as a customer right now. There's all, just all kinds. All kinds. So it's beautiful. Go to plasticbank.com. Join the newsletter at least. But tell us that you're, you're supporting. Be, be there and say, yes, I demand it. Go into your grocery store and ask the store manager to point out those things that have recycled content, recycled packaging. You want to make a big difference? Go be a vocal consumer group and go ask for it. Go demand it because again, they'll buy and they will sell you what people are asking for. So if you're asking for stuff that repairs the earth, then that's what they're going to race to give. Mm. So you're immensely powerful. Just be the person, just choose to become the person who asks store managers for recycled content and you change the world. Yes. Right on, man. Thank you, David Katz. You the man. Thank you. Appreciate you. I love it. Thank you for the call. Um, what? <laughs> Whew. I can't wait to talk more with that guy, with that cat, David Katz. Dude is deep. The dude has done his work. I don't want to ask him a lot more questions. He had to go. He had another call. I wanted to ask him a question like, you know, where have you done your studies, your deep spiritual studies? We'll get that next time. 
I, I'm going to keep my pledge on this. I am going to re-listen to this, and I'm going to record as many of the inquiries that he dropped as possible because I really believe, you know, I say this a lot, uh, the most mentally tough, happiest, successful people choose to live in a perpetual state of self-inquiry, like always asking yourself questions, like the ones he was dropping, but he was dropping them so freaking fast. I hope you got some of them. <laughs> I'm going to create every, a, a list of them. All right, that's my homework. All right, you guys, uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, and until next time, create miracles.